Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators, a production of KRWG Broadcasting. Your Legislators is a public service program providing our viewing audience in southern New Mexico the opportunity to hear about important legislative issues directly from their elected representatives in Santa Fe. Thank you for joining us for Your Legislators. I'm Fred Martino. I'm very pleased to have with us this week from Santa Fe, Senator Ron Griggs. Senator, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's a very busy time up there in Santa Fe, and we do appreciate you taking time out for KRWG and your constituents to talk about the major issues that are occurring right now in the legislature. Of course, the biggest responsibility is to pass a budget. The House has done that and the Senate is working on a budget. We should let our viewers know, of course, that we tape this on Friday and it airs Saturday and Sunday, so there may be additional developments that occur uh, after the taping, but I'd like to get your sense of where we are on the budget, things you like, and uh, then maybe some things where you'd like to see some improvements. Well, good morning, Fred. And, you know, the budget did pass the House. It passed 69 to three, I believe and it is over in the Senate, but it's at Senate Finance, so I have not had any real opportunity to, uh, to see the budget in any, any great depth yet at all. Uh, the, uh, the committee will work to adjust, amend, and change the recommendation that's come from the House, and then that will be brought before the full legislature for, uh, for discussion. So while I've heard of some things and I, I know of some of the uh, things that are in the budget, I, I really don't have a good feel for the whole budget yet at all. Do you see at all a, a confrontation occurring with the governor on the budget? Because there are some major changes in the House budget compared to what she proposed, for instance, uh, for state employees, uh, there is a 2% cost of living adjustment in the House budget. The governor only proposed 1% for uh, state employees, half that amount. Uh, what, what is your sense on that? Well, you know, Fred, the committees I've been involved in have kind of kept me uh, uh, removed from some of, the, um, some of the politics that might be at play right now. Uh, so I don't, you know, I don't know. I would like to believe that those sorts of things are, are easily worked out between, uh, between the governor and the House and the Senate, uh, because those are important things to people. And I, I believe that our governor, as well as the legislature, uh, wants to do the best that we can for the people that work for us. Okay. Let me ask you uh, about a very uh, big issue in the last legislative session, and uh, it's certainly something being discussed this year, and that is gross receipts tax reform. It certainly does not look like there's going to be a comprehensive reform. The state is still waiting for a tool uh, to determine what changes uh, would do if they were to be made. Uh, but there is still, I guess, some hope for some kind of changes in terms of closing loopholes, et cetera. What, what do, what's your sense of this, and, and what would you like to see in terms of changing the gross receipts tax? You know, Fred, uh, there hadn't been anything really come out of the House yet at, at all on, on that. Representative Harper, I don't believe, has a bill this, this year, but... As everybody looks at gross receipts, we, we know there are issues, we know there are, are things that maybe need to be adjusted. The, uh, the biggest one, the biggest one when you talk about gross receipts is, uh, is the food tax. And where you have that right now is you have the state that pays out over $100 million every year in what's called hold harmless payments to municipalities to, um, to take care of their loss of the tax on food. So you can immediately see if the hold harmless payments were stopped, 
the state would have an additional hundred, hundred and fifty million dollars uh, in order to adjust its budget. But if you did that, the municipalities like Las Cruces, Alamogordo, that where we are, uh, would be uh, would be immediately impacted. Now, Las Cruces, I believe, has has actually passed all three eighth increments of gross receipts tax, the hold harmless gross receipts tax that the legislature allowed them to do a few years back, thinking that they would do that as they lost hold harmless payments that have been being reduced every year for the for the last three years and will be continuing to reduce down to nothing over the next 15. So the whole idea with that was as that hold harmless phased out that then those taxes could be implemented in order to replace that loss in revenue. Las Cruces, Doniana County, I believe, jumped on that uh, pretty quickly and imposed all three eights. So Las Cruces, as the hold harmless payments go away, are going to be uh, are going to have to figure out ways to uh, to supplement their revenues as those things uh, are lost. But that's a that's a big that's a big uh, elephant in the room when you talk about uh, uh, gross receipts tax because people get concerned, they get worried, they believe that if you took away the uh, or you put the tax back on food, that that'd be very harmful to the poorest of our uh, of our citizens. You know, I believe that a lot of the the, the poorest of the poor, first of all, uh, receive uh, food stamps. So that particular uh, uh, reinstatement of tax might not be as uh, as damaging to them as one might think. But I believe that if you do that, you need to look at other things as well. So if the hold harmless uh, uh, tax was lost or the payments were lost, the food tax was placed back on, there are some other things that need to be done in order to, uh, to help the citizens out that way. And I think, you know, you do that uh, with the uh, working family tax credit and some other, some other things that help people out. But what you've done today, what Las Cruces and Doniana County and Otero County have done already, is they have uh, they put those three eights on, which then tax people for other things like diapers and children's clothes. So the uh, so folks who uh, who need help that way are, are getting caught up in in that. So that's uh, that's the thing that would make the most difference, the most immediate difference in uh, in dealing with gross receipts. But there are a lot of other things. You know we don't. For instance, we don't tax textbooks. I mean, do you want to do you want to put gross receipts tax on textbooks or not? Uh, do you want to put gross receipts tax on prescriptions or not? You know, those are things that certainly will come out. I believe of the uh, of the tax study will give us an idea of well, if we do that, what does that mean to our state? Certainly sounds uh, like uh, 2019 is when <laughs> a lot of this will be looked at, and uh, hopefully then will have a sound tool to see the effect of various changes that might be made. Moving to uh, education, another financial issue with education, and this is a really interesting one, something that uh, a lot of states uh, certainly talk about. Uh, and I was surprised this week in reading a column in the Albuquerque Journal at the incredible differences in administrative costs among New Mexico school districts. There are very, very big differences. And as you know, there is some legislation to limit administrative expenses by schools sending more money to the classroom. How practical is this idea and do you support it? You know, once again, Fred, I haven't haven't seen some of that in in the committees that I'm on. But you know, on its face, on its face, it makes sense that administration, you know, that's a that's a cost that we uh, we have to incur. But at the same time, where do we want money going to help the kids? And that's in the classroom. So I think we have surely got to look at that very uh, very carefully and make the right decision because. 
where the money's best spent seems to me to be with the teachers and the kids in the classroom. Uh, another continuing uh, issue in education, proposals to tap the land grant permanent fund in order to pump more money into education and in particular early childhood education. This actually is one of those where the legislature uh, may vote on this, but the people would have the final decision. The legislature would simply be voting to put something on the ballot to elect to let voters decide, do we want to do this as a state? Uh, do you support this idea? You know, Fred, we put the permanent fund there for a reason, and that, that reason is because oil and gas revenue at some point may either, you know, maybe we run out of oil and gas, or we decide that you know, we're able to use renewables in such a way that oil and gas becomes uh, less of, uh, uh, we use it less. And if that happens, if that happens, New Mexico really is in trouble monetarily. Uh, we need to protect the permanent fund. We need to not tap the permanent fund. We need to grow it where we can so we can then provide for the future needs of our, of our students. I mean, I believe, and we talked about this yesterday, uh, how much we've increased uh, K through three early childhood uh, education dollars already. Uh, I can't give you that number because we, we didn't quite get to it, but we were trying to look into, well, all right, how much has changed in the last eight years as far as funding early childhood? And we believe that it's quite a bit. Uh, do we need more? Well, if we need more, I think we need to find a different way other than attacking the permanent fund because it provides a lot of money to education today and if it's smaller we provide less money to education and in, uh, in the years to come okay uh, I want to ask you uh, a, a lot of more uh, specific questions but, but before we run out of time later in the show I want to give you a chance to talk about a particular uh, initiative that you would like to see during this legislative session pass uh, because it's something that you really care about, something that, that may be overlooked because of course much of the discussion relates to finances because that chief concern, particularly in the one month session, is to pass a budget. Well, you know, you know it is and uh, so you don't really, as a, as a legislature or legislator, you don't try to introduce a bunch of bills because you know most of them won't be heard. I've only sponsored uh, uh, basically two bills, one dealing with the Environment Department that they, they asked me to carry along with Representative Small from, in, uh, from over there in Las Cruces, uh, dealing with uh, lying to the Environment Department and what kind of, of penalty that should be. But closer to home to me in, in Alamogordo, is a bill that Senator Burt and I are carrying which would reduce or actually eliminate gross receipts tax from military construction to bed down the F-16s at Holloman. Now that would carry a, a four or five year sunset, so it's not going to go on forever. But in our part of the world, the military is, uh, is extremely important. And we need to do the things that we can do to make sure that they feel like that Alamogordo can be the home, the permanent home to the F-16 training mission. The Air Force doesn't have to look anywhere else. And so in order to encourage that, there's several things going on in Alamogordo right now with our school systems, uh, with our Chamber of Commerce, uh, and with people over there. But what we need to do is order to save them a little bit of money is just eliminate that gross receipts tax for that period of time to ensure that the F-16 and the Air Force choose Alamogordo as their permanent home. Very important issue, I'm sure, for the economy in our region, and I'm glad I got a chance to uh, give you the opportunity to talk about that. As you know, I'm sure there was another uh, issue that came up this week in terms of our military uh, in uh, this area, the land commissioner, Aubrey Dunn, uh, has been raising some concerns 
about the fact that uh, in certain areas that are protected due to White Sands Missile Range, the state, he says, is losing out on revenue that could be generated from state lands because there are very serious restrictions placed on a lot of land due to the missile range. What do you make of this? Well, I guess we could we could create a controversy there, I suppose, if we if we worked at it. But uh, but the land commissioner is charged with um, you know with maximizing revenue from state public lands, and so as he reviews those public lands, I think he's entitled to make the assessment that he needs to make uh, in that regard. Now, the big picture may be that in order for, you know, Alamogordo and, uh, and Las Cruces, White Sands, you know, we just have to have what we have in order to, uh, to protect the nation, to, uh, to provide for these communities. Uh, and will it be more, you know, arguably it won't be, but, uh, but certainly arguably that it will be, and it will be a better, a better setup for, the, uh, for our part of the world and the state. But, uh, but the land commissioner, you know, he has his opinion and he has his, uh, he has to look at those things in a very uh, careful and direct way and make his assessment. And I, you know, I appreciate him making the, the comments, but I don't know exactly how we can, uh, we can sit down and go through them and make much change, at least, you know, that, uh, that maybe we'd all agree with. Okay. Another uh, issue affecting our local economy and another local uh, initiative with a lot of local and state money in it is our spaceport. And as you know, there is a bill uh, to give uh, protection to spaceport clients. Now, critics, as you know, say, look, trade secrets are already protected. And they're very fearful that this, uh, what looks like a very broad uh, shielding of public information might even, for instance, uh, make it impossible for us to know how much rent uh, a spaceport uh, client is paying to, to be at a public facility. Uh, proponents say, look, we, we need this protection because other states are, are doing it. What, what do you make of this? You know, competition is a is a tough thing. The uh, you know the state of New Mexico has invested two hundred and some million dollars in that spaceport. Uh, to make it successful, we have to work hard in in several ways uh, to ensure that it has the opportunity to do that. Uh, if we if we close the door on that and we say that no, we we've got to be sure that. All of this is, is open and readily available. We run the risk of having people decide that this is not the spaceport for them. And if we want this thing to grow, we're gonna have to adequately protect the confidential information that these companies uh, request. Now, I believe, you know, the bill was heard the other day and it passed out of, uh, I think, Senate Public Affairs with a no rec, which means there was either a, a due pass or, or not. It was just let's move it to the next committee so we can talk about it there. And I believe it will be, it'll get some uh, more scrutiny there. And I believe, I've heard anyway, that there may be some, uh, some changes to the bill coming which may make the bill more palatable to the opponents. Uh, so we'll see, Fred. Um, I just don't know exactly what's coming next, but I, I know, you know, we've invested a lot and we have to be really careful in how we, uh, in how we address the needs of the spaceport and, and sit there and, uh, and work them with the needs of those people that believe uh, everything needs to be open and, uh, and transparent. Also in legislation, as I'm sure you know, there was another $10 million from the state to build a, a spaceport hangar. Do you support that? Yes or no and why? Well, Fred, I think I do. You know, when you look at what we do with economic development across New Mexico, uh, that's one of the ways that we can attract uh, 
we can attract businesses to our state by building facilities. You know, they're helping, uh, they're helping Intel, for instance, with, uh, with the facility up, uh, up there in Las Lunas. Uh, we've had some facilities in Alamogordo that we've helped with. So if, if they believe and they have an opportunity to bring in another tenant by building a hangar, then I think that's, a, that's certainly a, a reasonable request and hopefully a good use of money. Okay, well, uh, in terms of the spaceport, clearly uh, you're concerned uh, about the competition. Uh, a lot of folks are concerned about competition uh, being uh, hurt in another area, and that is uh, all of the things that are connected to tech using the Internet, because the Federal Communications Commission created quite a stir by ending net neutrality, the idea that all web traffic should be treated equally. Uh, and as I'm sure you know, there are uh, some in New Mexico who want uh, a state law which says uh, while the federal government is doing this, uh, if you do business in, in the state of New Mexico, uh, we have net neutrality here. New York has already passed uh, a, a law that would do this. What do, what do you think about this idea? You know, that's again, that's a, a bill I haven't, I haven't yet seen. And to, uh, you know, to get too far out in front of it, I it would be a mistake on my part. I, uh, you know, I just, Fred, on this particular issue, I have, I have limited understanding. So to try to get out and, uh, and, and answer your question, I'm, than the way I'd like to answer it anyway. I don't think I can get there quite yet. Okay, I want to move to another issue. You and I talked about this last year when you were a guest on uh, your, legislat le your legislators, and that was the idea of increasing the state's uh, minimum wage. This, because it's a short session, uh, may not in fact uh, be something that will be voted upon. Uh, last year, the legislature uh, passed a minimum wage increase. I believe you supported that, but the governor uh, vetoed it. Uh, where, where do you think this should go? Well, Fred, let, let me give you a, um, uh, an example of something that I saw uh, earlier this summer when I was in Tacoma, Washington at a, at a conference. Uh, we actually had heard from um, uh, an executive of Starbucks earlier that week talking about minimum wage. And he said that, you know, Starbucks probably could handle a minimum wage because of the uh, increase, because of the way their company was structured, how they did business. Uh, but he was really concerned about small businesses and how they would be able to adapt. And I thought that was really interesting. And I think there were a lot of people at that conference that were expecting him to say, that minimum wage increases are, are viable and very uh, very necessary, but he didn't he didn't do that. But as we when we left when we left and we flew back to uh, Alamogordo, we went over to the uh, to the McDonald's at the airport, and at that McDonald's were um, were three ca three cashiers, but there were also three uh, kiosks for uh, for you to go ahead and place your order and not have to talk to an individual. So I think what you see just by looking at that, you see the fact that the Im what the impact of a minimum wage increase could be. And if you're seeing that there, you would readily see it in other places and see it, you know, with the McDonald's, the Burger Kings, the places where you most apt to to notice something like that. You know, they would just get uh, more and more prevalent. So it, it shows us that if we talk about minimum wage and we deal with minimum wage, we have to be really careful in how we come up with whatever the numbers are, because if we push too far in one direction, well, we're going to lose people working and they're going to be replaced with those kiosks as they already were in Tacoma, Washington. Okay. Another interesting uh, proposal uh, this year in the legislature is to create a bipartisan commission to evaluate regents' candidates for universities. The governor would still have the final say 
uh, on who would be appointed as a regent. What do you think about this idea? You know, I've, I think that that's, that's one of those things that comes out of, uh, well, people are a little unhappy with the way some of the things have, have, uh, have happened in the recent past, and they believe maybe, maybe it's been a little too political. Uh, you know, if the, governor, if the governor would look into that in a professional manner, then I believe that, uh, that the way it happens today is, is, is just fine. I believe, you know, Governor Carruthers, we had, a, we had a chance to visit with him a while back, and he was talking about the procedure he used to look at, uh, at regents, and I thought that was a very reasonable and solid and well-founded approach. And you know, if you're, looking, if you're looking to find the right people, then I think you'll find the right people. I believe if you're looking for it as more of a political reward, well then you'll find those type of people too. But uh, I don't necessarily believe that's the way it's gone, but I think that uh, it certainly is, it's open for that. But I think we're, we're just jumping ahead here maybe when we really don't need to. Okay, real quickly, I have about a minute left uh, there's also a proposal for a nonpartisan independent commission for redistricting in New Mexico. Yes or no on that and why? Oh, absolutely. You know, you don't think anything is political until you talk about redistricting. And redistricting is extremely political. So if you can set up any way that makes it less political, I think that's a, that's a good approach. All right, Senator Ron Griggs joining us from Santa Fe. It's always a pleasure to talk with you and thank you for joining us on Your Legislators. Thank you, Fred. All right, thank you at home for joining us for the program. We have one more show next week. Senator Howie Morales will be with us. Have a great week.